Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I am not from Austin. I really enjoy uh, every, every chance I get to come to Austin. I'm uh, actually from Chicago. Uh, so I'm really hoping that the city is still standing when I get home. Uh, so really quick story. Uh, I was flying from Chicago to Austin at a Midway Airport yesterday and we're sitting for what seemed like an abnormally long time on the runway. And uh, the pilot gets on the, the intercom and he's like, hey folks, I'm really sorry. We think we're about fifth in line to take off. It's taking a lot of extra time. Uh, apparently there are a lot of private jets that are trying to leave to go to Cleveland for the World Series game. Uh, so we ended up taking off a half hour late even though the, everything was boarded and everything pretty much on, excuse me, on time. So yeah, people were pretty serious about it. Uh, and I'm not joking when I say like, I really hope the city's still standing. There were a couple of tweets, there's a Twitter account called Chicagoland Scanner, which listens to the police and fire scanner. Uh, so, so this happened. Uh, but more importantly, this happened. <laughs> yeah. So, so I did call my wife this morning. I was like, is our apartment building still standing? And she said yes, so uh, yeah. Uh, as was mentioned in the intro, uh, I'm at Braintree there. I've been there about five years. I lead up the security team. If you're not familiar with Braintree, we help businesses take payments. Uh, some of those businesses are ones you don't have anymore in the city, like Uber, uh, which I found out when I landed. Uh, but we also, uh, businesses like Airbnb and GitHub, uh, yeah, and uh, if you don't know, a few years ago, uh, Braintree was acquired by PayPal. And why that is really relevant here is because, uh, I have to say this, uh, if you've ever worked for a big company, you'll recognize this statement. Uh, please don't take the, these, as these views as PayPal's, they are my own. So yeah, uh, we're gonna start this with like, just a real quick overview of like modern cryptography. If you saw the presentation earlier in the day, we're not going to talk about history. We're not going to talk about um, kind of that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about a little bit about why do people use crypto these days, and then we're going to talk about all the places where it's failed. Uh, so um, the motivation for this is I'm interested in how both developers and security professionals can kind of come together and help us create a better ecosystem for for this kind of stuff. Uh, I like giving talks about failure. I like kind of grounding things in kind of like real systems and like real academic research uh, instead of just kind of, you know, getting up here and presenting uh, the latest thing that I've worked on, I kind of want to go back and talk about here are all the places where we as an industry have sort of fallen down. Uh, yeah, so in the modern sense, crypto, we use it for three purposes. Uh, the first one is confidentiality. This is what you think of when uh, you typically think of cryptography. I'm sending a message. I want that message to remain secret until the, the recipient gets it. Uh, I always use the, um, the example of I'm, I'm shopping online, so Amazon, you know, any, any online retailer. When I send my credit card information, I want to make sure that no one sees it except for me and the intended end recipient. Uh, the next one's authentication. Uh, this is also called integrity protection. So when I'm sending a message, I want to make sure that no one in the middle listening can modify that. Uh, so instead of changing my address when I order on Amazon, like I want to make sure that the information remains exactly as I sent it. Uh, and then the last one is identification. So this is knowing who I'm talking to. Uh, you'll often see this combined with the previous one in the form of uh, digital signatures. So I'm sending this message and no one's modified it since I sent it. And I, by the way, here's my identity along with that. Modern cryptography is a rigorous science. Uh, and what we kind of mean by that is it's based on really hard math problems. Uh, and these are math problems that we consider hard on classical computers. Uh, I will talk very briefly at the end about quantum computers and what's going on there. Uh, but these are, these are problems like for RSA, it's factoring large numbers into base primes. Uh, we have ways to do that, but they're not really efficient on classical computers. So what we're doing is we're betting no major advancements in math or computing for the time being. And just like any rigorous science, cryptography should be peer reviewed. Uh, this kind of goes into the advice that thankfully we actually have like gotten, you know, kind of cargo culted along to where everybody sort of will repeat it with knee jerk reaction, don't design your own crypto. Uh, you know, this, uh, this, this is great, however we're kind of missing an and there. Uh, we're missing and don't implement the crypto that you didn't design. So 
Like if, if, you go, if you go take the AES specification and implement it, you're going to get it wrong. Uh, almost certainly, you're going to get it wrong, and that's going to cause a big problem, probably not today, but eventually. Uh, you also, um, when designing these systems, uh, a lot of times folks will kind of get to the end, and then they um, they'll want to keep part of it secret, because they think that that will imbue it with some additional security. So in cryptography, we have this principle called Kirchhoff's principle. A system should be secure if the only thing I withhold is the key. So I should be able to describe the system to you at ad nauseum and detail, and you should be like, okay, this system without the key, I actually still can't, can't do anything to break the security of it. Uh, and this kind of, you know, leads into cryptography itself is very strong. Uh, the individual primitives like AES and RSA, I don't expect to wake up tomorrow and, and have the, you know, Ars Technica or whoever say, AES is broken or RSA is broken. However, I would not be surprised if there's some way in which OpenSSL uses AES or RSA together in some weird thing which is broken if you're on these unpatched versions between this and this. That happens. Just like any kind of secure uh, system, the seams is where we really see it kind of break first. Uh, and cryptography really isn't useful in like the primitives by themselves. You have to really use them together and put them together for it to be interesting and useful. Uh, I'll read this uh, for you real quick because I think it makes a good point. This is from the cryptography engineering book. Uh, you've probably seen the door to a bank vault, at least in the movies. You know, 10 inch thick hardened steel with huge bolts to lock it in place. It certainly looks impressive. We often find the digital equivalent of such a vault door installed in a tent. The people are standing around it arguing over how thick the door should be rather than spending their time looking at the tent. And what I kind of take from this is it's not uncommon to come into a group of security uh, professionals and see an argument over, well, we should be using a 128-bit key. No, it must be a 256-bit key. Uh, and you know, kind of like seeing this argument go on, while at the same time, there's like open SQL injection and you know, like other things on the system. Uh, so we're standing around arguing over this door thickness and not realizing there are a lot of other problems to the system. And uh, there are a lot of other problems that we're gonna go over, but crypto is very hard to verify and test. Uh, and even the experts screwed up constantly. If you can take away uh, one thing, this slide I think is really important. If you can just fit what you're doing into one of these models, data in transit, so that's data going over a network, data at rest, that's data sitting on a hard disk somewhere, on a flash drive, in someone's cloud storage, or data to be signed. Uh, if you could use one of these solutions or find a way to fit it into one of these solutions, you're gonna save yourself a lot of headache. And then the last uh, thing before we move on to the pitfalls that I kinda wanna talk about is I really want to encourage you uh, to make sure that we stay away from these low-level libraries. Uh, I often describe this as we've given a developer a bucket of razor blades and we've asked them to build a saw. Uh, and you know they may come up with a working saw, but they're probably gonna find that they've hurt themselves along the way quite a bit. Uh, these are things like OpenSSL, PyCrypto, Bouncy Castle. These libraries are, are powerful, but they often operate at such a low level that it's really easy to, to kind of put the pieces together incorrectly. So using high-level libraries like uh, Salt or Knackle, LibSodium, or Keysar, uh, Keysar is from Google, they have a bunch of different bindings and a bunch of different languages, uh, so there's probably one that can be used in your environment. I did promise pitfalls, so let's move on to those. All right, so the first one I'm gonna talk about uh, is random number generators. So randomness is critical to, to a crypto system. We use it for encryption keys, API keys, session tokens, password reset tokens. Without a good source of randomness, uh, everything else kind of falls apart. The first pitfall, uh, not using a cryptographically strong random number generator. Uh, in the 2012, I think, Usenix Symposium, uh, actually, I think this was maybe a little bit earlier, but there was a paper called I Forgot Your Password, Randomness Attacks Against PHP Applications. And what they did is they surveyed a couple of PHP applications and they found one where they used the built-in PHP random number generator, which is not a crypto strong random number generator, and they use, they're using that to build up password reset tokens. And they were able to find by observing features of the server as it kind of operated, they could guess what the random, uh, the the password reset token that got emailed to the user was, 
before the user was able to click on it. So they were actually able to then use that to kind of attack and take over the user accounts. And you know, that's, so from my angle this looks pretty bad. Hopefully, at least the people looking on up front, you can kind of see on the left, uh, there's a pretty clear pattern uh, in that it looks a little wavy. This may not be big enough to see it, but you can certainly see it in the PDF of the slides. Uh, but uh, in there, uh, you, you see a pattern, and that's the thing you do not want to see in your random number generator output. So the one on the left was generated on PHP, on like Windows XP, you know, just like kind of shoehorned into the worst possible situation for it. Uh, and then the one on the right was, you know, cat dev you random output it into a image program. The next one, uh, broken, using a broken random number generator. Uh, so this one uh, was pretty recent. There were entropy, so there was a problem with the libgcrypt, which is the random number generator in GPG. This had existed for, I think, about a, a, about a decade, I think since prior, or very early in the GPG kind of pro program lifecycle. And they actually found that they, they had been implementing the random number generator wrong for quite a while. There's a really famous one, uh, that's the Debian one. Uh, so uh, Debian had, had a pretty epic uh, issue, and that was uh, a developer on the Debian project uh, commented out this line of code in their fork of OpenSSL. Uh, so their version of OpenSSL that they package and ship along with their distribution. Uh, they commented this out in two places. Uh, and what this did was it actually was the line that mixed random number data from the system into OpenSSL's random number generator. Uh, it was done in 2006, and it was not discovered until 2008. So for about two years, the random number generator was pretty much hopelessly broken. Uh, and this goes to kind of show that bad, uh, bad cryptography looks a lot like good cryptography. And it can be very difficult sometimes. Uh, and so without this, the only, the only value put into the random number generator was the process ID, which is only 15 bits on Linux. So that's quickly exhaustible. This was the message that they uh, committed uh, with it. Uh, don't add uninitialized data to random number generator. This stops Valgrind from giving error messages in unrelated code. If you're not familiar, Valgrind is a tool to help C programmers uh, find like memory issues in their code. So this was essentially done to prevent a compiler tool from complaining. Uh, and they ran it, the most scary thing is they ran it by the OpenSSL mailing list. And no one said, oh my god, stop, don't do this. Uh, so for two years, every uh, SSL key, SSH key that was generated on one of these systems was completely broken. And as you may know, Debian is sort of a parent distribution to a lot of other distributions like Ubuntu. So this was pretty widespread. I went back and did some research. This is that line today in the OpenSSL source code. So this is one, one way to solve people from commenting it out. Uh, there are also uh, problems. Google had a random number generator issue in Android. And the way this was found is that people were using Bitcoin apps on Android. Their Bitcoins were being stolen. And the, the Google and people were like, what is going on? They actually discovered that for quite a while, the random number generator built into the base system on Android phones was broken. Uh, this one was December of last year, I think. Uh, Juniper, it was discovered that they, the parameters for their random number generator, they don't, they know, no, one, no one had any idea where it came from, which is a little scary. Uh, especially because they're using a random number generator that was kind of, ever since the Edward Snowden stuff, was known to be in league with the uh, NSA actually doing, uh, wanting to do kind of commercial level uh, you know, infiltration of people. Even though this, this paper was presented in 2007 on this exact random number generator talking about why you probably shouldn't use it. And they were using it in their, in their Juniper devices. Uh, and then I am wearing my FreeBSD shirt, so I do want to say FreeBSD is not immune. Like, nobody's immune. There was, uh, while they were trying to update the random number generator, they broke the random number generator for four months, and nobody noticed uh, until it was kind of eventually caught. Uh, fortunately, this only happened on like the development branch, so it didn't actually ever ship with a released version. But uh, this happens to happens to a lot of people, and it's kind of scary. Uh, next one: not using random data when it's required. So the Sony PlayStation, I believe, is the yeah, is the PS3, uh, used the elliptic curve DSA or elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. Uh, to sign their, their software updates. 
pretty standard, uh, not, not that surprising that they did that. Uh, however, uh, DSA and ECDSA have a requirement that there's a parameter K that must be uniformly random in, in there. And if it's not, then you can actually use some not that fancy mathematics to reverse and actually get the person's private key. They were using a hard-coded value. Uh, so people discover this and they, they're actually able to reverse the signing key for the software uh, in the PS3 uh, and presumably load homebrew software or something. Uh, but yeah, so this, this is like one of those things where it's like this was another thing that qu uh, called for it and they weren't uh, using kind of any random data. Uh, recommendations, uh, use a cryptographically strong random generator if that's what your thing needs. Uh, if you're on a Unix-like system, read from Debian random. There's a lot of consternation and uh, arguments about this. I'm going to stick on this side and say read from Debian random. Uh, I could send you a lot of material as to why I believe that. Uh, on Windows, they have cryptgen random and .NET has the random generator built in. Next up, uh, talk about hash functions. So I like to think of hash functions uh, as a fingerprint. And they're often, they're often called fingerprints. And that is, um, you know, just like a fingerprint, they're one way. So if I, I left my fingerprint on this glass, you can take that. But without a fingerprint database, you actually wouldn't be able to get much information out of that. You'd be able to match me up to it later. Uh, but if you had a fingerprint database, you could then identify me. And that's kind of the same thing with a hash function and some kind of document that you're hashing. You shouldn't be able to reverse it and get the document out. Uh, but if you had the same document or some kind of reverse table, you would be able to kind of match them up efficiently. That and ideally no two people have the same fingerprints, uh, thus no two inputs have the same uh, hash function output. Uh, first one, using older weak algorithms. This is going to be a pretty common theme, unfortunately. Uh, this was in 2008. Uh, MD5 considered harmful today. Uh, th these researchers were able to use a whole bunch of PS3, uh, P I almost said computers, but they essentially are PS3s uh, stacked together to calculate a, uh, basically something to go into a digital certificate so that a uh, CA would actually sign something and have it all hash out to the same output. So they were able to basically create their own digital certificate and get a valid signature for it. Uh, making, and they were able to then make themselves their own certificate authority, pretty much breaking the entire certificate authority system. Uh, and that was because even in 2008, some certificate authorities were still using MD5 which had been known for a while to be not great for this, uh, for this use. Uh, this was the death knell for MD5 in the CA ecosystem. The, those who were still kind of using it quickly stopped. Uh, except for Microsoft still had some. Uh, and this was, what, uh, this was in the Flame, uh, Flame malware, which uh, was discovered in uh, centrifuge uh, systems in Iran. And they, uh, th this was used, I believe it was, uh, they were able to use, uh, get a digital signature from like a valid Windows update thing, but they were able to do it through breaking a different a part of MD5 that no one had previously known you could kind of do, uh, showing that there's probably some serious intelligence level efforts going into this. So this actually uncovered a new vulnerability in MD5. Uh, and then in October, so a little over a year ago, uh, October 2015, there's a paper talking about free start collisions in, in SHA-1 this is not the same thing as the stuff for MD5, but it is meaning that we're getting there very rapidly. Uh, so this has actually kind of, even though the CA community was quickly moving to SHA-2, this picked up the pace a little bit faster in some ways. Um, so this is the logo for US Cyber Command. Uh, and there is, in, on the inside golden ring, there is a set of uh, numbers and letters. I'll blow it up for you. Uh, this is it. Uh, it turns out this is a hash. Uh, and it's hash of something very specific. Uh, it's the hash of their mission statement with MD5. So this is kind of like hash functions as a, as a design aesthetic. Uh, I will say, like, this is just because I find this interesting. This one actually doesn't really mean anything. But I do find it interesting that in, uh, like, 2007 or 2008, that they were still using MD5 for just their design aesthetic. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, misunderstanding checksums, or when to use a checksum versus a signature. Uh, actually took a while for me to find something online where I could do this, but this is uh, essentially, you know, you would imagine it's like an FTP file listing, or uh, this is probably an Apache directory file listing. 
And up at the top, you'll see there's a md 5 sums sha one sums file, uh, which you may remember from back in the day. Uh, and if you download it, presumably the, the checksum should match up. Uh, the pitfall here, or really the misunderstanding here, is when people download that file and compare it and go, awesome, no one has modified this software. And what it really means is my download didn't get corrupted. Because if someone could modify the software, they could easily modify the SHA sums because these are not signed by GPG or some other kind of digital signature. Uh, so just like making sure that that like, kind of misunderstanding doesn't, doesn't play into people's thinking. Uh, and then the last one, uh, talk about length extension attacks. So what, uh, what everybody's going for in these uh, for this problem that a length extension attack happens, typically, is they actually want some kind of message authentication code or a MAC. And a MAC is a function that has a key and takes some value and produces out some kind of, we call it a tag, but it's essentially a checksum. And it's a value that validates the integrity so that if two people share a key, they can make sure that this value doesn't get modified by anybody in the middle. It's a message authentication code. Uh, and so naively, some people will create systems where they'll take the, you know, a key and just concatenate it with a value and put it through SHA-256 and that'll be their tag. Uh, I've seen this quite a few times. And, uh, and that's great. Uh, like here's an example of it being used. Uh, but what this actually allows is for an attacker to arbitrarily add data to the end. And if they have the intermediate value and they have uh, and they add the stuff to the end, they actually can just update the signature without knowing anything previously in the value. I won't go into the details of how it works. It is very interesting, and I suggest you, if you're interested, you can kind of go look it up. Uh, but yeah, so this, this is a possibility. You can actually arbitrarily add data to the value. Uh, and the way you actually should be solving this is through something like an HMAC, which is a MAC that uses a hash function. So there's an HMAC SHA-256 function, which takes uh, some kind of key and value and actually produces the signature tag. Uh, this is a real vulnerability. Uh, Flickr had this, had this in their API. Uh, it ended up getting fixed. Uh, also, uh, Visa introduced a payments API, uh, and this was, this was February 2016. Uh, and in this payments API, they had this exact same vulnerability. They have since fixed this. They, they fixed it pretty quickly, but that was actually in there from the beginning. And this kind of goes to show that even a, even a company that ha, you know, has the security infrastructure of Visa, we still need to make sure that we're getting out to the developers and helping them with these things that, so that they're not potentially creating their own solutions to these problems. Uh, so use SHA-256, um, use HMAC SHA-256 if you want a MAC or a signature, stop using MD5. Uh, and I would say don't use SHA-1 in new projects uh, for things that require collision resistance. Yes, I know SHA-3 is out and SHA-3 is standardized. If you want to talk about that, we can talk about it later. Um, next one, talk about ciphers. So uh, once again, using old weak algorithms re rears its head. Uh, this was a, uh, a paper from early on, uh, this was in 2006, called Breaking Ciphers with Copacabana, where they built specialty hardware uh, to break DES. Uh, and so, I mentioned this, uh, not, you know, it is interesting, but like very recently, like within the last couple of years, I have done security assessments and found people using just regular DES to encrypt data in their, in their databases. And it is trivial to build uh, a piece of software or you could use AWS or whatever, and you could use that to break DES. Uh, RC4, we've known since 2001 that RC4 has problems. Uh, there was actually another one uh, in, in 2015 that where this kind of like, this really pushed people towards, now we consider RC4, if you like scan with Paulus or whatever, RC4 is considered a big no-no and you get a, you know, a big red X. But up until this, we actually, a lot of people were preferring RC4 because we were scared of another thing called Beast. Uh, so we were using RC4, even though we've known since 2001 that has serious problems. Uh, using ECB mode for block ciphers, this is one I actually heard, overheard somebody in the hall kind of joking about. Uh, so if you're, Real quick refresher, AES is a, is a block cipher primitive. It comes as a pair of functions. There's an encrypt function and a decrypt function. They both take a key, and then they take either the plain text or the cipher text, depending on which one it is. So the keys are 128, 192, and 256, but the plain text and cipher text are always 128-bit values, right? So they're 16 bytes. Now, I don't know about you, but 
Most of the data I don't want to encrypt is 16 bytes. It's usually a lot longer. Fortunately, most credit cards are 16 bytes, but that's actually a completely different thing. We don't use ECB mode for those either. Uh, but yeah, so normally I want to encrypt more than 16 bytes. Uh, and if, I, if I'm going to do that, the first thing, the very naive thing to think about is, okay, I'll just take it 16 bytes at a time and encrypt that, uh, and that will be my output. Uh, so this actually is a formalized thing. It's called ECB mode. Uh, the problem with this is that if you have any patterns in the underlying plain text, they're going to shine right through like a beacon. Uh, so this is the Braintree logo at the top. There's the Braintree logo encrypted in ECB mode. Uh, you'll sometimes also see this as a penguin. I wanted to make my own. Uh, ideally, what we would have is the thing at the bottom where it just looks like noise. Uh, but, uh, and you can do that with many, many different cipher modes, but ECB mode's the one in the middle where it shines through all the patterns. If you don't think you have patterns in your input, you're probably wrong because there's patterns almost everywhere in what we do because that's how we build up complicated systems. And then the last one on this, not using authenticated encryption. Uh, so this was presented at Eurocrypt in 2002. Uh, problems with uh, CBC padding and SSL. So when SSL and TLS were first uh, designed, they actually got it backwards. We now know that you should encrypt then Mac your thing. They were doing it uh, the other way. Uh, so this has introduced a number of problems uh, in TLS. We keep basically uh, putting hot fixes on it uh, and hopefully, you know, kind of hoping that they'll stay. TLS 1.3 will will actually fix this once and for all. Uh, next one, practical padding oracle tax. So this was the paper about Beast. Uh, so it actually took that previous paper and made it like real and made it practical and they showed the, the Beast attack. Um, Apple had one not too long ago in their iMessages. So they, they were not protecting the integrity of the ciphertext for like images and stuff. They were just protecting the integrity of something else, uh, the actual whole message or like some metadata about the message. And so this led to an attack. Uh, this was the dancing on the lip of the volcano uh, attack uh, from I, mostly John Hopkins, yeah, actually all John Hopkins. And you know, this, I kind of like, part of it is like, okay, developer is like, how many times do we, does it, do we have to say it hurts? But the, uh, the other side is, you know, security professionals like myself, we're, we're producing these, uh, these libraries. This is PyCrypto. Uh, and I know PyCrypto is not both state of the art in Python, uh, but it is still used a lot. Uh, and here, this kind of like signals the, the, you know, the gist of what I'm trying to talk about. You have all these different modes you can pick from, which you shouldn't be offering them a, a choice anyway. You should just pick one, one that is secure and actually go with it. And at the top, there's a quick example. Uh, in this example, they use cipher feedback mode, which is pretty much used nowhere. Uh, they're not providing any integrity of the cipher text, which we now know uh, from the beginning, you remember how I talked about confidentiality and integrity? We actually theoretically know you cannot maintain confidentiality if you do not main, maintain integrity. So any cipher mode that doesn't provide both is going to be broken. Uh, so recommendations, prefer the box, secret box stuff from, uh, from Libsodium, Salt. Uh, stop using DES, like seriously, like go run, change it now. Uh, stop building your own complicated thing on top of AES. Uh, and stop encrypting without providing integrity protection. Whole, you know, whole stop. Yeah? So both CBC and DBC are bad, so probably we should add because we should use CBC and AES. You jumped ahead of slide for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what if you have to use AES? What if, you know, your auditors come in, you have some compliance regulatory requirement? I have to use AES. Don't use ECB mode. Uh, be sure you're using authenticated encryption. Uh, GCM is a good first choice. There are a lot of caveats that go along with any recommendation like that. Uh, you do still need to make sure either you or the framework are verifying the tag or Mac. Uh, and it's still really easy to mess up in a very critical way and find yourself in this list. Uh, next, talk about a little bit about TLS. Uh, so we used to call TLS SSL. We don't, uh, that's not actually a thing anymore. SSL is mostly turned off everywhere. And if it's not, it's usually flagged as a vulnerability. But where uh, when we talk about it, it's so e SSL is just so ingrained into like the our like security monkey brain that we like everybody just says SSL when they mean TLS. So I'll probably I'll probably mix up and say it wrong too. Uh, first pitfall here: not verifying the certificate chain or the host name when making a connection. Uh, there was a paper uh, in 2012: the most dangerous code in the world. Uh, you can't fault them for being uh, a little dramatic. Uh, so this is, they did a survey of 
non-browser software. So this is mobile apps and all kinds of other stuff, uh, a lot of programmatic type things. And what they found is it was pretty bad. Uh, almost, uh, so everything that they, that they kind of surveyed, they're able to find some, some subtle thing. Browsers obviously do it wrong, but that's what browsers do, or do it right, but that's kind of what we expect browsers to do. A lot of like client libraries for APIs, um, a lot of mobile apps were doing the things wrong, either one or both of the previous things that I said, not verifying the certificate chain, or not uh, doing host name validation. Um, so I hope to run into Ryan Huber while I'm at this conference, because I would love to know the context behind this tweet. Uh, but yeah, th I thought this was pretty funny. So a little bit about um, certificate uh, chain of trust. Uh, so we, this is what we validate mathematically. This is kind of the mathematics in our certificate system. Uh, we have a certificate authority that's pre-installed on our system. There's a ton of them. Uh, but in this example, that's Captain Picard. Everybody trusts Captain Picard. He's the captain. Uh, but when I'm visiting a server, I'm actually talking to Ensign Tony. I don't know who Ensign Tony is. I don't trust Ensign Tony. He's a red shirt, probably, probably shouldn't trust him anyway. Uh, but Captain Picard trusts Jory LaForge, and Jory LaForge trusts Ensign Tony. So I can actually create this chain of trust where I'm like, okay, maybe Ensign Tony isn't so bad, maybe I can accept that certificate. Great, I've actually like, gone through and now I've validated the certificate chain. Uh, the next step is I need to validate the host name uh, that I'm actually talking to. And so this is, uh, I've actually, uh, I kind of liken this to when you hand the cashier your credit card and they go, oh, I need to see some photo ID as well. And then you hand them your photo ID, they look at them and they don't match the names up and then they hand them both back to you. I've had this happen because uh, I was actually handed them my wife's ID, which I had in my wallet uh, because we had just gone somewhere. And uh, yeah, they, they just handed it back to me and charged my car anyway. That is not doing hosting validation correctly. So it's when I connect to a server and it gives me a valid certificate chain but I don't validate that that certificate chain is for the server I'm actually trying to connect to. Meaning I can just go get like a free certificate from Let's Encrypt and you'll just be totally happy with it. Uh, so you check that the, you got the certificate for the hostname you intend to connect to. Uh, so the, one of the problems with this is hostname verification is protocol dependent, meaning it's technically different from SMTP as it is from HTTP. So they each kind of have to define exactly what they mean. Uh, and therefore, OpenSSL being this very generic SSL toolkit doesn't have it built in. Uh, and you kind of rely on the higher level things like curl or um, your like language framework thing to, to do this. Uh, misconfigured server settings. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Qualys SSL labs. Uh, and I, I actually looked on their like kind of like failure list to find one. This was a uh, government agency in Europe. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, and they had all kinds of problems uh, with the thing. And what I really like about SSL labs is they give you a nice grade. Everybody kind of understands, I got an F, that's bad. I should probably go fix that. I don't want going around people at work saying, thinking I have an F. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out, SSL labs is awesome. Uh, run it on your site. You may find something that you weren't aware of. Uh, but a lot of us run uh, sites that are behind a firewall that Qualys wouldn't hit. So they're internal services, things like that. Uh, for that, there's a tool called testssl.sh that I really like. Uh, so use this to hit internal services, things like that. Runs a very similar battery, similar battery of tests uh, using just the OpenSSL in the box. Uh, testssl.sh. Th thank, thanks for uh, amazing new top-level domains, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, it, I, every time, it still gets me too. Uh, yeah, uh, if you are, if you don't know where, where do I like? I don't know how to configure Nginx to be have a secure set of uh, settings. That's not a problem. Mozilla will help you. Mozilla has a uh, SSL configuration generator where you kind of pop in. I'm using Apache. I'm using this, uh, like this version of OpenSSL, and they will. Uh, if you really want the slides, what you should do is you should follow me on Twitter, and I've already tweeted out a link to the slides. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, so if you, so at the very end you'll find my Twitter, but it's actually at the bottom of every slide. Uh, but yeah, so this has a, uh, this has, basically drops in, kind of gives you a, a really good starting configuration. Uh, and then lastly, uh, using a broken library, 
Uh, we're, we are all very familiar, I hope, with the heart bleed bug. Who has not heard of heart bleed? Don't, okay. I'm, if someone raised their hand, I would, promise I would have been okay with that. Uh, but yeah, so heart bleed was a really big deal. Uh, there's another one, Apple's go-to fail, where they actually were missing validating part of the, um, the TLS handshake. Uh, it was pretty bad. And then, uh, you know, we get a new one every couple of months, right? So I, I just haven't added any of the new ones. Uh, so do ensure you're validating your connections. So go around and make sure that it's, someone didn't leave the verified none in there from when they were talking to some development server, uh, and now it's in production. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, lean on a framework or library if possible. Check that, it, check that that library does the right thing, because not every library does. Uh, unfortunately, the, especially like some of the newer ones, they may roll past it for the ease of convenience. Uh, ideally set up kind of some automated testing. There's a lot of great examples from badssl.com where it just shows you all the various ways SSL can be misconfigured or your settings could be wrong or things like that. Uh, so set up some automated tests uh, based on like kind of what they, what they have set up. Uh, trust, this is the last thing I wanna talk about. Uh, how many people have gotten this prompt before, you can keep, raise your hands. Gotten this prompt before at all. You recognize it, you've seen it. How many of you validated the fingerprint before typing in yes? Yes. So uh, SSH has, the, has a trust model that's different from our like CA model that we use for web browsers. Uh, and the trust model for SSH is called TOFU, trust on first use. And that's you and, you and SSH are kind of friends. SSH is like, hey buddy, if you validate it this one time, I will mathematically guarantee it every time after this. Uh, so it's up to you to validate it the first time. And then of course, if you've seen that one, you've probably seen this. Uh, this can mean a number of different things. Uh, the server's been rotated, it has a different IP address, all kinds of different things. Uh, and typically if you Google this, your answer you're getting on like Stack Overflow is just RMRF your known host file. Uh, which is not great because you're deleting all, all the other stuff. Uh, there are, you should just remove that one entry in the known host and validate that everything is actually copacetic. So this is a scrolling list of all of the uh, CAs that Mozilla trusts by default. And I, did, I built this like six months ago, so I'm sure it's expanded since then. Uh, you're not intended to follow it, it's intended to be wacky uh, to kind of prove a point, and that is we, tr we trust a lot of CAs by default. You should think about that. Uh, so there are methods, uh, mechanisms to help with this. A big one is called cert pending. Uh, there's actually a whole uh, Mozilla standard in, in browsers called um, HTTP public key pinning that's gaining a lot of traction and popularity. Highly recommend checking it out for your sites. Uh, so we should really be thinking about what organizations do we trust. In that list, there is the Department of Homeland Security. There is Hong Kong uh, Bank. Yeah. And like a bunch of other stuff. It's like, do we trust all these organizations? Do we trust their hiring and firing practices? Uh, you know, look, we, we should really be thinking about these, uh, these things as security professionals. I'm not, I'm not suggesting going and removing some from your systems, but you should really think also in that list would have been Startcom and Woe, Woecom, yeah. Or no, Woe, wo whatever, I, there's a Woe sign. Woe sign and Startcom, who recently got just actually slapped down by the, C, or by the browsers because they had found out that they were doing, among other things, backdating certificates so that they could fall into a different, uh, you know, pre-SHA-1 ban. Uh, as well as like all kinds of really kind of like just bad stuff that you wouldn't, you wouldn't want your certificate authority to be doing. So if you're using one of those, you should actually go switch because you're about to be detrusted in almost every browser. And lastly, I did, talk, I did say that I'd have just a tad about quantum computers. So pitfalls, assuming current crypto will last forever. Very nebulous. Um, <laughs> So th this is a paper by Peter Shore, and this was published in 1997. Polynomial time algorithms for prime factorization in discrete logarithms on a quantum computer. If you, so what, what those two things are, prime factorization, that's RSA. Discrete logarithms, that's ECDH and uh, regular DH, Diffie-Hellman. So that's elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and, and uh, finite field Diffie-Hellman broken on quantum computers in polynomial time. Polynomial time means fast. So you can just think of it if you forget your computer science course. It means, fa means faster. Uh, so this was in 1987. This was kind of made more uh, practical uh, you know, as, as things have gone on. 
But this means that our current generation of, of crypto ha has, a, has a time limit on it. And people are thinking about this. Uh, Google recently uh, actually began experimenting with, in addition to using elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman for the key exchange, they're actually gonna wrap uh, some experimental post-quantum resistance. So these are, uh, this is an algorithm that is, we believe, resistant to a quantum computer. A quantum computer wouldn't be able to break this in polynomial time. Uh, and they're kind of wrapping it around there. So even if that turns out to be bunk, and it actually turns out to be even faster to break on a classical computer, you still get to fall back on the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Uh, but ideally, these connections would now be secure even against an adversary with a quantum computer. And Google's motivation for this, uh, I believe, uh, is that we know that there are intelligence agencies out there grabbing huge swaths of our internet traffic and then shoving them on a, on a drive somewhere and keeping them in a mountain waiting 20 years or so until we have quantum computers. So this is hopefully making these connections not vulnerable to breaking at that point. That's the goal. Uh, so my recommendation, follow the PQ crypto discussion. Uh, but stay away from it uh, until the industry starts to standardize. And uh, the last one is hope researchers are moving fast enough. All right, uh, it is over. Uh, if, you, if you enjoyed this and you want to learn more, Stanford has an amazing Coursera class uh, called the Stanford Crypto Class on Coursera, which are all words I've said. Uh, there's also the Montesano Crypto Challenges at CryptoPals. So this is a developer-based approach kind of learning and how to break these, uh, these kind of various algorithms as a developer. And then they have the solutions in various languages. And then lastly, um, do I still have time or did I run out? All right, still have some time. Uh, for questions, there's my Twitter. As I said, I have tweeted out a link to the slide, so uh, you can check that out. Yeah, so the question was when I say authenticated encryption, do I mean authenticate the other party or compute the Mac? I mean the compute the Mac. So that you should validate the message hasn't been modified since the originator sent the message. So authenticate the message, exactly. Yeah, so when you authenticate the ciphertext and then decrypt the ciphertext together as one thing, that's called authenticated encryption. So like GCM is a mode that provides authenticated encryption. Right, yeah, so like how do we, essentially is how do we ever trust anything on the internet? I've, as I will, I will sum that up. Yeah, how can we trust the people who create it? Yeah, and like this has reared its head multiple times. Uh, Diffie-Hellman primes uh, and, and like in an RFC were found to be compromised, as in someone inserted these numbers for use in encryption into an RFC and they found that they were backdoored. And so they were standardized. Uh, there's been a lot, kind of a few things like this. Um, how do we trust them? Um, you verify the best you can. Uh, so there are, there's a tool now where basically you, if you get primes from prime numbers from somebody, uh, like or Diffie-Hellman parameters rather, you can validate that those are actually good Diffie-Hellman parameters. But then you gotta trust that program. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like the NSA used to like, I think like pre-Snowden when I was giving this presentation, I used to say, well, like I used to tell the story about how the NSA when they're standardizing DES, the NSA took it and kind of tweaked it a little bit and gave it back to them and. And they uh, gave it back to the standards body, and the standards body's like, what, what did you do? And they're like, don't worry, it's cool. Uh, and so they ended, up standard, they ended up standardizing that, and what we found out like 10 years later when we discovered uh, differential cryptanalysis in academia is that they had fixed the original DES proposal for differential cryptanalysis and actually made it better. Uh, and we didn't know about it, so we knew, so they had differential cryptanalysis 10 years before the academic community. So like they've done things to improve the security because if you remember, the NSA, if you like go ever talk to anybody who's worked there, they used to, although this is all changing, they had two missions. They had SIGINT where we're gonna go out and be the big bad guy that you hear about from Edward Snowden and we're gonna try to do that to make America safer. And then they have information assurance and that we're gonna create standards and we're gonna make things better for our, for our domestic corporations, for our governments uh, so that we're stronger as a country. Uh, so that, you know, like, DES was essentially, from my understanding, originally kind of standardized as part of, like, Lotus was, like, we really need something for, for encrypting stuff as part of, like, software for Lotus. Like, that was a, one of the big drivers for it, if you, like, read the history of all this stuff. So 
these, these standards were like, we really need a standard for a US industry to go out and use for encryption, and that's what became DES. Uh, nowadays, yeah, they definitely, I think since September 11th, that like has flipped in importance, for sure. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>